Um, well, right now I'm down in Tucson, Arizona, just here for a few weeks. <laughs> um, but I live um, primarily in Fort Collins. We do have a second home in Estes. Um, I've been a long time part-time resident I, there. I have, and, I have a friend but, in Fort Worth and he happens to be next to a hospital. So he's got nonstop power. That's good. Okay, so sounds like Becky needs to cut, uh, needs to mute herself. Oh. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so um, we, we primarily live in Fort Collins and we have a part-time home in Estes and um, we've been going up there on a part-time basis since 1992, but it was actually, I'd been doing that for 20 years until I heard, before I heard about Anna Wolfram in the tea room, um, which at the time when I learned about her, I was so amazed that she'd been such a well-kept secret. Um, I, the way I learned about her was that I was doing some um, research. Um, I was volunteering for Rocky Mountain National Park in their cultural resources office, and they gave me an assignment to research prominent women in Estes Park history for uh, Women's History Month that year, which was a really fun assignment. And um, so I learned about Isabella Bird and Esther and Elizabeth Burnell and um, I'm a Jean McPherson and a whole bunch of really great, interesting women. But the one who really captured my attention was Anna Wool from Dove, um, because I just found that idea of a tea room in the middle of the woods so fascinating. <laughs> and I thought, how can I go there? What, what was this woman like? And so I just began searching for more information about her. And I was just fascinated about her from the first moment I learned about her. I mentioned it to my next door neighbor at the time um, up in Estes. Her name is Trish Stockton. She was working for the park at that time. And she knew all about the wigwam um, from talking to other folks she knew locally. And she said, oh, I can take you there. And I said, really? Oh, great. So we hiked there together. Um, the first time I went was in 2012. And after that, I began my research. Um, because I thought, this is crazy. Here it is in the middle of the woods and nobody knows anything about it. And I want to know more. And I think other people do too. Um, I wish there'd been more information to unearth about her. Um, the thing I was constantly frustrated with was the lack of information about her Anna's businesses in downtown Estes Park. Uh, she had several of them. She was a smart businesswoman whose accomplishments were remarkable for someone in that day and age. Yet nobody seemed to pay any attention to her in recorded history. Why, I wondered. I've since learned that women and their contributions have often been ignored in recorded history. That's something I hope will change. And so I, I was, my hope was is that the book would be just a tiny part of, what, uh, of that change. Anna was a woman ahead of her time, and she deserves to be remembered in Estes Park history. Um, the wigwam is what Anna is most well known for among the few locals who know about her, but I'd like to tell you about a few of her other accomplishments to get us started. Um, of course, the main reason is, is well known. She's the first single woman to independently earn her homestead patent in the Estes Valley along with all of the challenges that brought. Um, she was required to make improvements, cultivate the land, and live on the property for five years in order to earn her homestead claim. So imagine those challenges, harsh weather, rodent infestations, no indoor plumbing or electricity, loneliness, and never-ending chores. But here's some of the others that are less well-known uh, those of you that have read the book probably know some of these, but let me remind you. Um, she was one of only two Americans accepted to study at the Sorbonne University in Paris out of 100 applicants. She studied French literature there. She studied drama at the prestigious Oxford University in England. Um, as a young adult, she emotionally and financially supported her brother, Philip, through a difficult mental illness and until his death. 
She persevered among many stops and starts with her education until she finally graduated and got her college degree at age 35, an unusual undertaking in that day and age at that age. She wrote and published numerous books and plays. She honed her skills until the dramas she wrote became known as among the best modern plays. She managed to successfully operate the wigwam as a profitable business for years while still holding down a teaching position in Kansas City during the school year where she was a respected teacher. She was an excellent cook who had a great reputation. She perfected the art of high altitude baking on a wood fired stove, a much more challenging undertaking than in, on today's uh, temperature controlled electric ovens. And it's still challenging at that at high altitude. She was a savvy businesswoman who grew her business steadily, branching out and eventually operating five businesses in the Estes Park area, plus another business in New Orleans. New Orleans. She became a serious collector of Native American artifacts, uh, developing a huge respect for their culture and customs. Eventually, she donated her large collection to the Panhandle Plains Museum in uh, Canyon, Texas, for future generations to enjoy and learn from. She became wealthy enough to become a philanthropist. She was a strong supporter of the Estes Park Women's Club, and especially in creating a library for the town of Estes Park. She was a much loved and devoted daughter, sister, aunt, friend, and eventually wife. She finally married um, at age 51 to um, Dr. Orville Dove after many years of significant accomplishments on her own. But despite all this, Anna was almost completely ignored in recorded Estes Park history. Why is this? That's what compelled me to write the book. People need to know about Anna Wolfram Dove. I think we all agree wholeheartedly, Nina. <laughs> and we're better for having read her about her. Um, so um, I'm gonna, um, kind of throw discussion questions out to the group. Um, if you guys have questions uh, for Nina or myself, please <laughs> jump in. Um, so just kind of to kick things off, is, is there any general questions or comments you guys want to get started with? And also remember to unmute yourself. <laughs> How do you do that? This name. Hi, Neil. Yep, the mute and like the video controls should be down to the lower um, left hand side of your screen. And I, I have a comment. Yeah, and, Donna, go for it. Well, I live in Jacksonville, Illinois, but I've spent a lot of time out there and was just absolutely honored to be uh, there for one of your annual dinners many years ago. And across the table from me was your speaker, get ready, and uh, Mills Kiley. And we became really good friends. As a matter of fact, I have a box of letters she's written me that I, I really need to do something with. But when you said she was the first, I thought, well, Catherine Gerritsen, Esther Brunel, and I looked up the dates and wow, that was a lot earlier than those two ladies. And I'm just, I, I mean, I just read the book and I loved it. Um, I love the story about, I have to just give a plug for this because I love the story about Catherine Gerritsen and Esther Brunel meeting on Christmas Eve. I'm sure some of you know that. I, I read that story every Christmas Eve. It's kind of my tradition. But um, I, I always wanted to write a book about women homesteaders. And I, I love that, I mean, I'm a little jealous, but I love that you did this because this is a wonderful story. And uh, that's all I have to say. But I, I just, and I saw somebody, named Linda and I thought for a second end of it. No, of course she's not gone. So um, I'm really, I have to say thank you for this. I'm really enjoying being at the Estes Park Museum for an hour this morning. I do have a comment about that though. You were wondering uh, if Anna was indeed the first single woman homesteader. And I have in the very front of my book under an author's note I that, <laughs> yeah, that Ida McCreary was actually the first one. And I, do, um, I did believe you, but I was just thinking, you know, Boy, that must be really early, and it oh, really was, really was. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's such a big undertaking for a single woman. I mean, Ida had all the help of her family and involvement in the homestead for years and years, actually, before uh, she earned the homestead claim. But that was as part of a whole family effort. Anna it, it was uh, in a more relo remote location and did it all on her own. But Nina, isn't there a little part inside you that thinks, ooh, that'd be so much fun. I mean, just a little tiny part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I admire her so much and, oh. and think about her life a lot. These women. Oh. Absolutely. Well, I was, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was, I was especially interested because uh, years ago, oh, maybe 25 years ago, uh, we when we were coming up for the summers, uh, we rented out on Spur 66. And at that time, it was the oldest log cabin in Estes. And it since has burnt to the ground, unfortunately. But we lived out there in the summers, and my boys and I would hike everywhere. And here we were not too far away. We'd go up to the Y camp, hike all around. And I had no idea about uh, Anna and about the tea room. So it was especially uh, interesting and it struck me that there's so much that we could be lost and that we need to preserve. And so thank you for, <laughs> for doing this uh, and letting us know about her and the tea room. Well, uh it's really by the, the thinnest thread of chance that any information about her was preserved, really. Um, the fact that um, John Redman, who is the son of one of the original people who bought the wigwam from Anna, um, there was a group of, uh, let's see, um, his father and uh, another bought the wigwam, um, and then they, Anna had uh, her, well, actually, her niece, after Anna's death, had to repossess it because they didn't make their payments on time. But still, Thomas Redman, the this, this son of the man who had originally bought it, was back in New York and had some information that he had saved about Anna. There were several newspaper articles written about her um, in Midwestern newspapers and long features with pictures and told about how her unusual lifestyle um, and those newspaper articles were preserved. And then um, I think, and I'm not positive of this, but that picture, the most famous picture of Anna standing on the front porch of the wigwam with the um, elk antler above her head, um, I believe that that was one of the photos that were found in an album that was found in a dumpster in Denver and then eventually um, donated to the museum, thankfully. Um, but had, and then the, the fact that Thomas Redman had those, that, those newspaper articles about Anna and some information. Uh, then John Reichart, whose father um, was um, one of the three owners of the Wigwam property um, after it was repossessed and then they bought it again from Anna's niece, Louise. Uh, the, the Reichardt family had it for so many years and, and after selling it to the, well, no, maybe this was before, I, he started compiling information about, about Anna during the, t the later years of their um, family's involvement at the Wigwam. And he was the one that, he was a, a chiropractor, Don, Dr. John Reichardt, he and his family lived in Estes Park and had a chiropractic practice there for over 30 years. His wife was the office manager, Anne, and uh, John, compiled a lot of basic information about her life and um, saved that picture and some others that he, that either got, came out of that photo album from the dumpster or uh, were other sources. He, he gathered some initial information. And back in the 1980s, he, used, he gave a few presentations about Anna around town and saved that information, but then never did anything with it. Had he not done that research and preserved some of that information, gotten he got uh, he got a hold of the information that Thomas Redman in New York had um, because of a chance visit that Thomas Redman had 
paid to his sister. His sister was living at the wigwam one, um, one year in between college and graduate school. And she, he happened to pay her a visit and told her about this information that he had. It was still 14 years later before uh, anyone in the Reichardt family got a hold of Thomas Redmond back in New York and said, hey, what do you have? And he said, here, I've got this stuff. Yes, I'll have, be happy to share it with you. And uh, one of the things that he had was her diary, which the museum has, um, I think the original of. Uh, but anyway, her diary has been um, preserved by the museum. And then uh, uh, when I first started doing my research, the, the library had some of that information too. But um, just the thinnest thread of chance. Who, who, I mean, those things could have very well not happened and we would know nothing about Anna, was my point. <laughs> I love it in the book where you tell us where some of these things are. I, I love that you did that because I need to get to Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Like what thing do you mean? Well, some of her things, some of the things she owned, like, I don't remember oh. if you mentioned the diary in your book, but there were some other things that you mentioned that oh, like her still at so and so one, there was something in Denver, and the historical in Denver and and I love that when you know when you said these things are still here, available to see I love that. I should have kept a list of them. <laughs> Well, her stove uh, was at the watch top for many years, and now it's in the museum storage, but uh, that was used as a condiment table at the notch top for many years. <laughs> uh, I have a this little... Neil, can, can you hear me? Well, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm just one, I, I got distracted in your initial presentation. What was her connection with New Orleans? Well, um, after her husband retired, he was a physician in Kansas City, and after he retired, uh, they eventually summer or wintered in New Orleans. They would still come to Estes Park for the summers, but that's where they ended up settling um, for the time when they didn't, you know, they never, she really spent very few uh, winters in Estes. And so. They established a home there, and then, yeah, that's why she had a, a shop there. She had a shop in New Orleans? She did. It was called the Totem Pole. I, don't, I was not able to find out anything else about it other than the name. Um, but it was also, I think, the same type of thing. You know, she always had this um, big interest in Native American artifacts, and um, I'm sure that's probably what the what the, what it carried the same as here. Thank you. Anybody All right. Else? Any other any other general comments? <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, is there any um, interest in the national park to perhaps uh, make a easier way to, for people to hike up to see the ruins of her tea house? I had heard, actually I saw an article maybe three years ago, maybe two years ago, in the Estes Park um, Trail Gazette um, about the fact that the park was building a new trail um, to um, replace people used to see people have to go across private property now to get there yeah. from Highway 6 and they were building a new I don't know where it was but a new trail um, to go back in there in that into that area from Highway 66 but I haven't heard anything about it since then so I don't know what the status is um, but yeah it would be nice um, to make it more accessible. Uh, although, you know, that does have risks because there's been a lot of vandalism to those buildings over the years. Um, but, you know, my dream would be to actually, you know, have those buildings preserved better, have, have some recognition of Anna and what she accomplished with, at the very least, a sign that talks about her and what, what happened, the tea room that was there uh, on the property so that people that hike back in there know uh, you know, on the on the west side of the park where they're doing the 
um, reenactments of the pioneer days in the Holsworth cabins. Wouldn't that be fantastic if they reenacted what the tea room was like and actually uh, showed people um, how, what it was like to serve tea on that porch and people hike there? I'm sure people would love to do that. There'd be plenty of people that would be willing to hike two miles to do that. But, um, you know, I don't know. This may, might be a pipe dream that the park would ever actually look at doing something like that. But um, it would be nice to uh, have more recognition of the structures um, by the park. Um, can you hear me? I, I don't yeah. seem to. Can you hear my yes. microphone? Yes. Um, I've hiked to the Wigwam many, many, many times. I belong to a little hiking group and it's our custom every year to have a group go at least once, maybe more than that, um, and take tea and cookies and go tell the story as we sit on the porch, uh, usually of her cabin next door. But the park has done quite a major uh, restoration of the property and put new roof on and done all kinds of structural you can't go in it you can't look in it but you can see it and its beauty and its place the tea room itself is in in quite good shape you can walk all around it you can go through the back porch area you can go to the two cabins that are next door one where she lived and the other one that she rented out you can see her homestead cabin, which is amazingly small and <laughs> kind of broken down. And the hike there is not too bad. You start at Lily Lake and you take the trail that goes to the left out of the parking lot that goes down to the Storm Pass Trail Junction. And when you get down to the creek, there's a a bridge across the river you do not cross the bridge but you turn right there and you go right down an old road which has been as you were mentioning last uh, year a couple of years ago the park redid that trail because a lot of it was washed out in the 2013 flood and so it has been rebuilt and there's a, some really nice switchbacks that make it a pretty easy to go down. And you can go right on down to the tea room in it. And it's about a two mile, two and a half mile one way hike. Um, and not too, uh, too bad for coming back either. So, the last chapter uh, of my book uh, talks there about the, also, exactly how to get there. There are also signs there telling something about it as well. So they it, have been quite. Ooh, I, I haven't been there in about a year, but I've never known of any sign that was there. I believe I saw one the last time I was there. Wow, that's a major development I didn't know about. And but as far as the directions you were just talking about, uh, that is laid out real explicitly, explicitly for those of you that haven't seen it in the last chapter of my book. So if you do want to hike there, just go to that last chapter. It gives you those exact instructions of exactly what to expect and where to turn and what direction because I know I've talked to a lot of people who or a few people anyway who have tried to hike there but got lost and couldn't find their way because it's not marked it doesn't say to the tea room no there's yeah. nothing like that but um, it is easy to find and just beyond it it does become private property so that's as far as you can go where it's still in the park That's nice that it's such a treasured tradition with your group. I think a lot of people do have a tradition of going there. And I know uh, uh, there's people from, that have, have uh, that tradition that go there from the YMCA. And um, Sarah Donahoe, uh, who used to be Sarah Holt, um, was the hike master for many years at the YMCA. And she said she always uh, brought groups there. And in fact, a couple of times she surprised them with uh, she went and hid behind something and put on a long skirt and then brought out a carafe of tea and served them all tea and cookies. <laughs> oh, wonderful. We bring our own. About, yeah. how, about how long does it take you to walk that hike? It's two, two miles and something. How, how much time does it take you to? Probably an hour and a half. 
hour and a half, one um, way. One way. One way. Okay, I want to try that sometime. Okay. Maybe a little longer coming back up. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. so you're basically going down and then you're coming back up. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I don't know, can you, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, yeah. I'm Megan McMillan and I, our family um, has been coming out to Estes for years and my parents lived up here um, in Wincliffe for years and I have the house now. And I hate to say it, but I never knew about her before this book. And so I, it, and my mom was so interested in the history because she grew up her summers um, up on Holy Hill. I don't know if you know that reference. Um, her father was a Presbyterian minister and, and worked at the Y camp um, during summers um, with the, a lot of the other Presbyterian ministers that helped build it out. Um, and so she started out coming out here when she was about nine. So that was probably in about 1930. Um, she started coming out with her family and spending whole summers out here, um, out on the hill, out on Spur 66. And then, like I said, she and my father retired up here into Wincliffe in, in the 80s. And um, she was really interested in the history, but I don't remember her talking about it. And I'm surprised because it was so close to everything. That, yeah. And maybe she did talk about it and I didn't pick up on it, could be, but we never went over to it. And so it's sort of, um, anyway, I it made me, I was real excited to read it to sort of, because I feel part of the area and part of it because of being here now, et cetera, and growing up this way. But so. Oh, my uh, pleasure. Are you related to Stuart McMillan? Yes, I am. <laughs> That's my brother. Yes, down in Fort Collins. <laughs> I've and, uh, for many years and um, yeah. I, at one time, years and years ago, I visited him there at your house. <laughs> oh, okay. Where my parents are, or we're just up here with my brother? Yeah, the house up on Wincliffe. Up uh, on Wincliffe. Again, back in the 80s. I've known him for many, many years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, cool. I'll yeah. mention it to him. <laughs> yeah. He, I, he knew about the book. We're Facebook friends, and so he, he's seen it. He's, he's a surprise, too. He had never heard about that. But one thing I do want to note is that, you know, the the office there at Wincliffe where people who stay at Wincliffe check in it, gate right, house. Yeah. Right, or gatehouse right behind that is a sign and it talks about animals mm -hmm. and some other yeah. people on one on the signs that are right there yeah I don't think I've ever stopped and read it <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's only a quarter mile from the edge of Wincliffe to, over to the wigwam so I've been was it hoping to walk over there this trip up i'm up in Wincliffe right now and i was hoping to walk over there but it's um didn't quite make it this this trip so but i'm hoping to actually explore a little bit next time i come up and spend a little bit more time yeah that'll be an easy walk for you from where you're make Stu come with me <laughs> oh great <laughs> well i worked at the y in the 70s and did not know about the wigwam, but became a good friend of Anne Piper Austell, who you wrote about on page 57. Um, lifelong friends with her. So she and her sister Isabel were two of the first early school teachers in Estes Park and two of the first women hike masters here. Yes. Did everything from the Y. Uh, I have a child named after Anne. So Anne told us about the wigwam when our kids were little. So I think the first time we went, because we were doing bigger things before we had kids was in the late 80s when we could still just walk up the road that now the private property owners don't want you in. Um, but she talked about going to the wigwam uh, on their smaller hikes, because if they were doing Long's Peak or something, they would be getting back way too late. Um, so she, she told us about being on the porch at the wigwam and she and Isabel becoming friends. So uh, a piece of history there. Yeah, those women were remarkable what the hikes they did, uh, if they went all the way uh, to Long's Peak from the Y in one day, which I guess was pretty common from what I understood. <laughs> yeah, I think it was 26 miles. Um, yeah. Mm. By day, some of us recreated it. I was not one of them. And uh, we then bowed in respect even more to Anne, who could do it. But, but you mentioned that the, the women that worked there in the summer 
would spend 10 cents to go over the Y to take a bath. Uh, Ann talked about that too, hiding towels down where there were about eight bathtubs so that when they got back from a hike, they could get right in there and get a bath. Um, <laughs> why? That's a great story. Uh, I, have, so, I have her on videotape telling stories of hiking. Amazing. The, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so we did the same thing with Isabella Bird, but um, can you describe, or would, would somebody describe, or we can go around the virtual circle, <laughs> um, uh, what is one word that you would describe animal from Dove? Nina, do you want to start us off? I would say ambitious um, because I think it's remarkable not to um, do what she did with establishing the homestead and the tea room, but then also just then she goes off and establishes all these other businesses in downtown Nestus Park. Uh, that's that's ambition. Creative. Because she was an artist, uh, teaching in the high school, uh, so many different subjects. Um, just and with her pastries, her ability to bake and cook. I mean, creative in so many different areas. Definitely. I'd say savvy, having all this. Well, I don't want to take somebody else's word. Just let's, let's just say savvy. Tenacious. Good one. Energetic. She she, sound, she just had so much energy and learned to do so many things. She just must have been busy all the time. I wonder how how often how long she slept at night. <laughs> Adventurous, because not only did she come and live out here and do what she did, but she was traveling quite a bit in Europe and everywhere else. It seemed like she got around quite a bit. So very adventurous. That was the word I was going to use, Megan. I'm sorry. No, no, that, not a. It's yeah. it's just that really describes her whole life that she did so many different things. I I would add Hardy. Uh, all those um, winters and the building the log cabin and everything. She just you know, had to have a strong constitution. I would say determined. Anybody else? One one word descriptions of Miss Wolf from Dove. I think we really kind of painted a picture there of her with our one word. One word. I would say also entrepreneurial. Yeah, that was mine, entrepreneur. <laughs> For sure. All right. Um, so Anna, obviously we just talked about, she accomplished so many things in her lifetime, like from starting businesses to traveling, to writing, to you know, all, all kinds. Um, what do you think was her biggest accomplishment? Don't all go for it at once. <laughs> Nina, what do you think her biggest accomplishment was? Um, well, I think establishing that homestead and receiving the patent for the 160 acres of land, that was probably the most difficult thing she did because really only being able to be there part time and then the, the requirements that the government had um, to um, improve the land meant that she had to build something on it. I, uh, she may have uh, not had to cultivate the land, but typically that was a, a part of the requirement too, is you had to grow something, uh, which would have been really difficult. Um, so that was probably, uh, you know, she did so much later too, but that was probably single, the single biggest accomplishment in my mind. Just living independently in, in such conditions is very much of an accomplishment. 
Well, this yeah, is especially, a, oops, sorry, go ahead, Donna. No, well, I was just going to say, this is a tiny accomplishment, but it's one I always, I have a lot of books and I've read a lot of history. And my, the reason I got interested in Colorado is because my parents retired to Lyons. And it seems like every single book I read, including this one, talks about that trip from Lyons to Estes. And it just blow. I mean, it's a silly little thing, but because I think of driving up there and we finally got an, used to it enough that we weren't the, the, the uh, vacationers blocking the people that are trying to get to work. You know, we finally got through, over that. But just the, how difficult it was to get up there. And, and I mean, let's just look at all the traveling she did with her teaching. And then, I mean, I was a, well, I still teach, but I, I teach online. <laughs> I teach college now, but I remember when I taught high school, I wanted my summers off. I just wanted to sit on my deck in the sun, which is what we did back then. But so with that travel, just going back and forth and, I mean, it wasn't like getting your car and hope it starts. <laughs> yeah, uh, the people that first homesteaded up here, uh, even before, uh, that brings to mind uh, Frank Webster, uh, Anna's friend who um, started Wincliffe. Um, he worked in Denver, but he had this homestead up there. And what kind of a commute was that? I mean, before the, the horse and... Uh, carriage ride before they had the the stanley steamers going up the canyon between lions and estes that was a six hour ride in a in a horse and carriage between I lions we read that part because i thought what <laughs> yeah i did yeah and and didn't you say that he left his wife up here because he couldn't get up that often so he left his wife up here to take care of it isn't that yep. the person yeah that's right let me somebody but, requirements somebody had to live on the land and I uh, think about her <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it would be nice to know about how she, you know what she did because wow being left up here by your husband unless you were really into that that would be a that would be a, a deal <laughs> yeah there actually might be more information to be unearthed about Frank and Cora Webster I, I found quite a bit on him in his career that I did include some of it in the book uh, because he was such a well-known newspaper man and had such unusual articles and and things, um, maybe there could be more unearthed. It, it is quite a job to unearth history. <laughs> yeah, it is. She was also a very shrewd bu businesswoman and investor, knowing how to just uh, improve enough to that she could afford it and. Uh, because a lot of other of her neighbors use Kirkland up here by Lily Lake was deeply in over his head. And then she had so many other businesses going. Yes, uh, you know, what an amazing con contrast between the way she handled finances and the Hughes Kirkwood people who are much better known in Estes Park history than she, nobody knows about her, but she is just plugging along, being financially responsible and resourceful and um, she did it. I've got to say on top of it, I thought you'd think a lot of her for taking care of her brother, because that's a really tough thing to do, particularly when she had all these other things going on. And then being a caretaker of someone that had has problems, health problems and mental problems would be an incredible sort of additional burden on top of everything else. And yet she did it and seems to have done it well and willingly and everything else that went it goes along with that um, that really impressed me yes she uh, she that was what interrupted her finishing her college degree was having to take care of her brother mm -hmm. all right so we talked a little bit about like other like Hughes Kirkwood and other um, businesses and even like cafes and restaurants um, that were in and around us to spark at the time. Um, after reading this, um, what do you think made the wigwam so special? Well, you, uh, those other businesses, um, you kind of think of like businesses up in the mountains and, you know, it's kind of rugged and all. And then then here's this tea room, which is, you know, kind of fancy and, you know, it just not in that same mold as, you know, going to 
um, eat buffalo steak or, <laughs> or whatever in, in some of the restaurant, you know, the other restaurants, the typical ones, you wouldn't think of a tea room up in the, up in the mountains that you had to hike along trail to get to it just just seems so different than what you would expect patty maybe it was the opposite after hiking people were so thrilled to find it and you know have nice tea and linens and yes, i certainly exactly. would you, you remember those african movies i mean i've never been to africa some of you probably have but where they have linens and silver and all that. Oh, and I, right. I just think it's perfect. And I make really good cucumber sandwiches, Nina. So when you're ready to <laughs> have a little celebration, I'll volunteer. I, mean, I love cucumber sandwiches. I make really good ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was probably just so surprising for people that, to come across her tea room in that location in the woods in such a remote area. Um, that was just part of the charm is so it was so unique to find that out in the middle of the woods. I also think it's really interesting that I think there were more, there were a lot of women out here that people don't talk about, you know, the wives of the men that were doing things. And, you know, I'd like my grandmother up on the Holy Hill with my grandfather who was taking care of the kids and doing stuff and hiking and whatever while he was off working. And I, it was a place for you know some of them to go, um, the women to feel comfortable in doing things that, you know, is perhaps something for them. But it, so a lot of people that, you know, weren't maybe catered to, got something mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I wonder if she, what she, all that she did and accomplished here, if that was in. Um, you know, if she was a role model to other women to kind of follow in her footsteps and maybe step step outside the box, especially back in in that era, you know, as opposed to now. But I feel uh, like she's an example for people for those other women homesteaders that came after her. Mm -hmm. That perhaps Catherine Gerritsen might not have tried that if she hadn't seen what Anna did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I could imagine it was kind of a sensation, you know, what she did because, you know, back then women didn't do stuff like that, not, not on a regular basis, you know, and um, I'm sure people talked about her all the time. Or at least not given the, or at least not given the credit for, just like Anna really True. wasn't given credit for perhaps doing this even today. Um, but, you know, a lot of women did a lot of things that behind their husbands or on their own that people didn't see. Yeah. And sometimes I wondered too if, if what Anna did was dismissed because it was so unusual. Just people thought she was eccentric and just kind of dismissed her and didn't think any more about it. I certainly hope that she will be remembered on the new women's monument that's planned for downtown. Oh, I hope so, too. I uh, hope you guys all, if any of you are involved in that or know the people in charge, can put in a good word. I think Jean McGuire is the one in charge, isn't she? I'm not. I'm not sure. Sounds like Becky's affirming that. She's oh, Becky says yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, did anybody read that book by uh, Catherine Garrison, uh, Garrettson about homesteading Big Owl? I pulled oh, together yes. all my books and I couldn't find that book. And I have two copies of it. So absolutely. And I was thinking of Esther Burnell. I mean, Enda used to talk about her father all the time, but you had to remember that he died when she was, what was it, two, I think? And she really didn't remember him. And of course, Esther Burnell kept things going for Enos Mills, you know. I was thinking about that, but I could not find it. I woke up at four in the morning and thought, I need to get all my home study books together just for fun. And it's a wonderful yeah. story. Well, that, that book was remarkable. I mean, it really showed the hardships of yes. what of being a single woman homesteader was like. Mm -hmm. And I think though, Catherine Gerritsen had a harder time than Anna 
um, mm -hmm. because of the fact that she was um, further, re even more remote than the wigwam was. She didn't have the advantage of the, being on the Wind River Trail, which was a popular hiking area. And so Anna uh, just automatically had these people going by that would be customers, uh, where uh, Catherine was way up further in the woods at a much higher elevation um, in the Tahosa Valley. Um, I think about a thousand feet higher than, than the wigwam. So she had harsher weather, um, more remote. It was just more difficult existence for her. And originally, her, her, originally her tea house was on a main road and then they changed the road. Yeah, so, that's so, so she just hung in there after that happened and did what she could to let people know they could go out of their way to the Big Al. But it was, yeah, you're right. There were real parallels, but it was harder for her because of that. They, re, they rerouted the road and it messed up her location. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the first first books that um, the book club, there it is, uh, that the book club ever read. Um, oh. So kind of a, a well-loved local there. Um, and this kind of discussion that we're having right now leads right into my um, next question. Um, uh, so we've talked about Catherine Gerritsen, Is Isabella Bird, um, these other kind of remarkable local women. Um, how do you think Anna compares to her contemporaries? Um, Eleanor Hondius comes to mind. Um, they were all part of that kind of um, up and coming women's club at the time, 1912. Um, any further thoughts kind of there? I noticed that when I was researching, um, trying to find evidence of Anna's involvement in the Estes Park Women's Club, um, most of the women, she was one of, I think she was the only single one who was having to support herself and um, singly. And so I noticed, I mean, the one picture that's uh, so famous of, the, of that picnic of the women's club, uh, I put it, a, a picture of it in my book, but it's on the cover of that other book um, that I'm sure it's probably available at the museum about the women's club, uh, the women get it done or something like that. Anyway, ask, Anna's not in that picture. And I think simply that's because she was working her tail off running the tea room and all these businesses and she didn't have time to go to a picnic. Um, and <laughs> like that. so, so um, you know, these, these other women, there, there's a lot of them that accomplished a lot. Um, and uh, trying to think of the name of the woman that owned the National Park Hotel. Um, Harriet Byerly. Harriet yeah. Byerly. Yes. And, um, you know, she ran that alone, but she was married. She, I think maybe she was divorced, though, at some point. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, that's my thought comparing her to her contemporaries is the fact that she was really one of the few single ones. And so her life was a little bit different than theirs. What is the book about the women's club you mentioned? It's, it's called, we just did it last year, so it's right on the top of, top of my mind. It's called um, Then the Women Took Over. Um, oh, nice. I'll have to get that. A Hundred Years of the Women's Club. So it was um, written um, by Harriet Burgess for mm -hmm. the 100th anniversary of the Women's Club. And we do, we have it here at the museum. And I'm sure there's copies at the library and um, our local one, McDonald's. One books. other thing, um, I'm a PEO in uh, Jacksonville, Illinois. And I was, that was, I'm going to share that with my, chapter that was really neat that you shared that in there that she they the ladies in my group will love that <laughs> so oh yeah those women were a force to be reckoned with yeah. it, that was just awesome what they did i just absolutely love how ellen ellen i believe it was eleanor hondius she was going to present those funds to the the men's group and and the men didn't want to take their ideas about uh what to use the money for and she said well thank you very much i'll just take the money and they went and started their own club. Mm -hmm. I just love that. <laughs> I was thrilled to find that. And how grateful we are, Nina, to you. I, I have Janet Robertson's book here in front of me, too, and she didn't write about her. So I think I'm so grateful you wrote this. It's just wonderful, to, And I'm loving being here. <laughs> you have to forgive me. I miss, I miss Estes Park terribly. <laughs> 
Well, welcome, welcome to Estes virtually. We're glad to, <laughs> we're glad to have you here. <laughs> um, so kind of along that same line of thanks to Nina, are there any other, I mean, I'm not volunteering anyone to write it, but are there any other um, books or, or are there any other properties, um, people that you would like to see a book like this written about? I mean, sometimes it's like, oh, we didn't even know about that person until the book comes around, but um, does anything leap to mind? Is there There's a book about the founding or the building of the YMCA camp? Yes, there is. They've done the history on that. I think it was maybe um, the 75 year anniversary and the uh, okay. anniversary. So they're, they're available. Yeah. I know this when, uh, when Jan Robertson was writing The Magnificent Women of the Colorado Rockies, she pursued Anne, my friend Anne Austell, for probably four or five years. And Anne would always say to me, I don't have anything special to say. Um, I, you know, there was nothing special about that. So um, finally she agreed to be interviewed by Jan, but you know, part of that's true. I'm not sure there'd be a whole book um, out of Anne and Isabel, but Isabel, her sister, was one of the first skiers out here. And I have a picture of a poster of her waving, promoting skiing in Estes Park. And, <laughs> wow. and Anne kept coming back. Anne, Anne uh, died in 1997 and she was born in 01. So I had the privilege of knowing her for 25 years, but, but they hiked everywhere around here. Um, and she climbed longs again when she was 50 and she was very proud of that. Wow. She always called it the Wind River Trail, um, you know, going up mm -hmm. there to the Wigwam, she'd say, then we'd hit uh, Highway 7 and we'd go and often Enos Mills would be standing on his mm -hmm. front porch. He'd say, oh, there's those crazy Piper sisters again. And, um, they wouldn't always uh, do the summit of longs, but they were big naturalists. They loved, you know, flowers and animals and just enjoying the hike. Is there enough information on them for a book? I'm not sure. I have, um, she used to uh, sit on the front porch of the YMCA museum and tell stories of her hiking. And uh, those of us that loved her, we recreate them. You know, we, we talk like her, we mimic her. But I have some of them on VHS. They're poor quality, but you can hear her telling the stories. And several years ago, a friend of ours, Carol Blanchard, who some of you may know lives here locally, she reenacted Anne for one of the history days downtown and told stories from those sitting on the museum steps, uh, told the stories. Cindy, I think you have a book. <laughs> <laughs> I have a heart full of love. Is, are there any books on the Elkhorn Lodge? So the museum just um, kind of republished Eleanor Hondius's memoirs uh, wow. two years ago, I believe. So yeah, I was thinking that yeah, Ellie uh, she had a she had a memoir and that covered most of that, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's not specific. I mean, it kind of it's more about Eleanor than the Elkhorn, um, but right. definitely, obviously, the Elkhorn plays a big role in that in that book for sure. One thing that's been going around in my head just the last few days um, is about the Mace family that owned the bald pate um, mm -hmm. because I, I just recently discovered that uh, a new family has just bought it a couple of months ago and with great enthusiasm there and unearthing all of the history in the building and I just noticed that um, she, I don't know her name, but the woman that, um, that has been doing most of this posting, she found a a cabin with some old artifacts just the other day that she posted pictures of letters and photographs from the Mace family that she, uh, um, she just, I mean, nobody's ever looked at this stuff. Lois uh, Smith said she never had time. And so this, there's a whole treasure of information in there. I wonder what she's unearthing. I, I was thinking about trying to talk to her about it. Yeah, Lois, much like Anna Wolf from Dove, is a very busy, <laughs> busy business owner. Yeah, I can see why Lois didn't have time. Yeah. And she's probably enjoying her rest right now, too. 
Yeah, anybody else? Any buildings, folks, you would want to see a book about? Again, you don't have to write it. Well, I might as well volunteer. I have uh, finished a final draft of uh, History of the Essex Valley Land Trust. And, and it hits on a few of the local notable people in town and their land holdings. And so mm -hmm. what, that should be out in a few months, but it, it has some, it covers n not so much the retail establishments like the, a tea house, but it does cover sort of the history of people trying to protect the land in the valley. So. Interesting. Well done, Becky. Mm -hmm. I'll be watching for that. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. So just a couple of final questions before um, we wrap up and then vote on the next couple of months um, titles. Nina, um, was there anything that was like really surprising to you that you found in your research that you had no idea um, before kind of starting this journey of writing a book? Well, a couple of things. One I already mentioned was the fact that so those photographs that were found in a dumpster in Denver, I was shocked to hear that. Um, someone would throw that kind of thing away and that they were preserved, thankfully. But the other thing that I just thought was really a fun, surprising fact was the fact that the, um, the old weathered wood from Anna's barn um, was saved by the Reichardt family and eventually ended up on the walls of the notch top and is there today if you look up high in the dining room that that natural weathered wood up there is from anna's barn i just love that very cool very cool um is there anybody else else who found um a part of anna's story is part, uh, particularly impactful We've kind of mentioned a lot of her accomplishments and anybody, anybody else? This is Virginia? general, but I loved all the diagrams and pictures and that just, I love that so much. It's so much fun to read a book and get to see what you're looking, and I love that. Thank you. <laughs> It was quite a job digging all that up, but I love research, so um, it was a fun project. It took me way too long, but it's kind of the nature of the beast sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. Michaela, are you done with your questions? Uh, yeah, unless anybody else has anything they want to share, any final yeah. thoughts? I'm always, I uh, want to make sure you had gotten of your questions because um, I, I have a very, very ephemeral connection to her place in New Orleans. Oh. Uh, I want to make sure everybody else did their stuff and so forth and I had time to relay this. It is very ephemeral. Um, I do tours in the Rocky Mountain National Park and uh, summer of 2018 I was working for Green Jeep Tours and we had a 130 tour and these six retired school teachers showed up. They were all 65 going on 35. I'll never forget them. They were just high spirited and interested and so forth. And one thing I really remember about them is that they put themselves, all six of them met at a girls college on the East Coast. And I wasn't street smart enough to follow up or just, but they put themselves through college. They're high wire trapeze artists, actors. Uh, work for circuses during the summertime. That's how they put themselves paying for the tuition through college. And they all ended up teaching, they all ended up marrying lawyers and so forth. And um, they uh, uh, would, since they retired from teaching at the age of 60, they had been traveling around the country because every time they were at a, music, at a circus, they'd go into this town and they had all kinds of, of off time. So they would go to the museums in all these little towns which I do. So we got along fabulously. We had all these stories to tell each other and so forth with each other and so forth. But um, one of them uh, mentioned, asked me about the Wigwam Tea Room. And I said, I'd never been there, but I can show you where it is on the map. Oh, we know where it is. We all hiked up there yesterday. Oh, oh Neil, you're muted. Oh, Neil, Neil. 
You hit mute. You hit mute. Let's see if I can unmute you. Nope. Unmute. Now can there you hear you me? There you go. There okay, you go. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, uh, I got distracted when you mentioned New Orleans, and it turns out that one of those people uh, had an aunt and an uncle living in New Orleans. Who, when they found out they were going to Estes Park, she, their aunt and uncle told her to go visit the Wigwam Tea Room. And I didn't read your book. My sister has the book. She winters in Illinois, of all things. So I'm going to be reading the book uh, and so forth. I'm very interested in it. But uh, yeah, they had hiked up to the Wigwam Tea Room. And the day after the tour that they were going with on the Green Jeep tours, they're going to hike up to the top of Long's Peak and so forth. They were very athletic. And like I say, they were 65, looked like they were going on 35. They were amazing. They all had their little whiskey flasks with them and so forth. And uh, but anyway, uh, I took them on the historic tour and I knew all about the Catherine Garrison Tea Room because I had read the book and I belong to three different book clubs. That's one reason I didn't get to read your book today. Something had to give. <laughs> but uh, I took them to the spot where her tea room is, where Catherine Garrett's tea room is. And I pulled over to the side and I talked all about the history of it and so forth. And I had the book with me. So I showed them a copy of the book. And um, so, um, Michaela, they did go to the museum and bought about three or four copies, I think, uh, of, the, of the tea room. But uh, I'm sure that I understood what you knew about New Orleans, and I'll, I'll definitely read the book. Uh, one additional thing, I don't know if anybody, everybody knows this, the, the Garrison Tea Room. Um, if you go in the north entrance to the road, to a uh, Big Isle Road, and you drive south on that road, watch for a sign in a driveway that says Big Owl. That's the location where the Big Owl Tea Room was. And that sign is, you can't miss it if you come from the, from the north going south. Just for, if anybody doesn't know about that, that's, and uh, the tea room burned, correct me if I'm wrong, I, can, I think it was like the 1940s or 50s or something like that, maybe even the 60s. But, um, the, uh, apparently, and I'm going to go knock on the people's door that have a, a home there someday because apparently I've heard somewhere that they know all about the history of the tea room and so forth, and they uh, know something about. I guess they know where the ruins are, where the foundation was, and all that stuff. But just look for a sign. The sign is about three or four feet wide by about two feet high. That says Big Owl on it. So there, that's my contribution. And you're, the people that you met that told you to, uh, uh, or they were from New Orleans, or their aunt and uncle were from New Orleans. Did, no, did you learn what the actually they was? were? Actually, actually, they were all retired teachers. They're all living in the Panhandle of uh, Florida, and uh, one of them apparently was talking with her aunt and uncle, who said, uh, "Oh yeah, we uh, we know about this shop in New Orleans, and go go visit the tea room." Let it, take some the, pictures and let us know what you found. Were the aunt and uncle living in New Orleans then? A new, that, new aunt, maybe? I, I don't know if they're living in, like I say, I wasn't street smart enough to question and, and so forth. Um, we're, we're all, the whole, the whole three, hour, well, the tour is supposed to be three hours. I actually ended up spending four hours with them. Uh, we were talking a mile a minute the whole time about places, we, other places we had visited and so forth. And, um, wish I had known this was going to happen. I certainly would have followed up. But I, I called uh, when I knew you were going to do this about a week ago. I called the owner of the big uh, um, Green Jeep Tours, and she doesn't keep records that far back who they were, and so so I, I missed out there. But uh, apparently, her aunt and uncle knew about the shop in New Orleans. So I'm going to make sure I definitely read the book. Did you have any? Did you have, you had the name, I, I know you said, but was there any other information in the book? About? No, unfortunately, I, I was never able to find out anything. Um, it's Okay, well, it's hard I, I am going to follow up. I'm, I'm sure that the New Orleans, I love doing stuff like this. I love doing research. And I'm sure New Orleans has a museum, a history museum, and I'm going to contact them and see if they know about this uh, place.
Great. Well, if you find out anything, please let me know. Uh, I have, um, uh, you can get a hold of me through my website at ninakunzi.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's on the cover of the book too. So uh, I'd love to hear if any details are unearthed. You know, one of the things about doing research um, in, in these old newspapers is that they all require a subscription. And so I could have subscribed to the New Orleans papers and the Kansas City papers and spent a few more years seeing what I could dig up about Anna's life in, in those two areas. But at one point, uh, I reached a point where I was like, well, enough is enough. I, you know, I just can't spend any more time on this research. And it was pretty daunting to try to think about, you know, how much money it was going to cost to subscribe to all those newspapers too, to, to try to dig up details and, or travel there or whatever. Um, one thing I do think that would be really neat, though, is to go um, to the Panhandle Plains Museum in Canyon, Texas, which I understand is an outstanding museum, and to see uh, Anna's collection. Although, disappointingly, when I contacted them about the, the artifacts that um, they have that Anna donated there, which are more than 200 in number, uh, they don't have them all on display and they didn't even have the staff. I was willing to travel there, but they didn't have the staff or the room to be able to put them somewhere for me to look at all. And they said, well, you know, you're welcome to come here and, uh, you know, we'll give you a list of, of what we have. And if you want to um, see certain items, we can try to pull those, but we can't show you everything. <clears throat> and they sent me pictures of the, of, the things that they had on display, um, but uh, there's quite a large collection there. Anyway, that's that's would be a great field trip to go down to that museum and see um, what they, what else they have too, because it, um, it's an outstanding museum as well. Mm. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention too, as we close, is that um, I have a slideshow. Um, that I, I've done a few times before the pandemic uh, around Estes. I've, I've talked about the wigwam and, and, and um, shared this information um, with the slideshow. And I, I plan to do that again when, when we're able to um, meet again in person. And it's so fun because people are so enthused about history and about learning about Anna and the wigwam. and. Um, it's really fun to share the enthusiasm and the information in person. And so I'm looking forward to the opportunity of doing that. I mean, the, I think the Women's Club someday will have me come. Uh, they contacted me uh, and said, yeah, we want you on for our slates full for this year and we want you on for next year. But then that then the pandemic happened. And um, I did one presentation at the Bald Pate and that was really well attended and people just love hearing that information. It's so much fun to talk about. Yeah, Nina, we would love so to look have for that. We would love to have you back here at the museum in person. We can't wait until we can get everybody together. Um, these virtual programs have been a good stopgap, <laughs> you know, um, but there's really kind of nothing like, like an in-person program. So. Yeah, we can't wait until that happens again as well. All right, so before we vote, does anybody else have any, any final thoughts, comments, questions about Anna Wolfram Dove and her wigwam tea room? I think the museum should organize a tour, or I should say a field trip to go to the wigwam with those that are capable of making the hike. And you could lead it. You know, um, I did have a, the the um, the Rocky Mountain Conservancy had a uh, I had arranged with them to teach a day long class about Anna and the wigwam, and we were going to hike there. Uh, that was canceled due to the pandemic. We were supposed to do that last August. Um, we may try to do that again, but maybe maybe the museum should do that. Yeah, that would be maybe better. Yeah, an on-site program like that? Oh, that'd be so much fun. Uh, for sure. All right, so. Um, uh, yeah. This, Michaela, this yeah. Neil, I, I can't let this, um, I have, my wife and I love to travel. We have a camper and so forth. And um, 
we have been up into Canada before the pandemic, of course, three times, uh, going up to uh, Jasper and going along the uh, Icefields Parkway. And there is a picture postcard area called Lake Louise. I don't, if you ever see pictures of it, you'll know what I mean. And when you go to Lake Louise, the first time we went there, we just happened to be talking to some people at the hotel there. They have a fabulous hotel there with an English tea room and all that stuff. But they talked about this tea room up above Lake Louise. And so, oh, that sounds interesting. So you go around Lake Louise to the north, I think it's the north end, but the other end of Lake Louise, and there's a trail that goes off to the right for about two and a half miles going uphill. And you come out, you go up this valley with incredible scenery. Uh, and you get to this tea room where they have wood stoves and they have college students during the summer they bring all the stuff up on their backs. And they sometimes during the start of the summer, they have donkeys, they have to haul stuff up and so forth. But they make these incredible scones uh, on this wooden stove <laughs> and they have tea, you have about 50 different teas or so forth. And you sit there and you're having your tea and your scones and all of a sudden there's this incredible boom and your teacups rattle and so forth. The glaciers are calving just over the ridge from the tea room. And if any of you, I just bring this up because if any of you are ever, after the pandemic is over, if we ever get to travel to Canada again without uh, passports, you need to go to Lake Louise and if possible hike that. It's not that hard a hike, it's not that steep, but it's the scenery, you forget that you're tired hiking to the tea room because the scenery is so incredible. And to set out on the porch tea room is just a, a great experience. and. Uh, We've been up there twice since that first time, and we took, uh, we've taken relatives both time, and they were just blown away with the experience. So for whatever it's worth, I'm, re I'm reminded every time I think of the uh, wigwam and so forth, I'm reminded of this tea room, and it must have, been, must have been kind of the same experience for people that we experienced hiking to that tea room. Sounds very similar, and also uh, the fact that in the beginning when Anna started the tea room, there was no road that that led all the way to it. So people had to either hike or, or go there on horseback. And so, yeah, it was, she hauled her stuff up there with the donkey and wheelbarrow and so forth too. Yeah, it sounds like the tradition lives on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, for next, um book club i have a couple of suggestions please feel free to throw out if you guys are dying to read a particular title um please let me know and we'll kind of get that in the hopper as well um so i've got a couple of suggestions and then we'll kind of take a vote and um, we'll move on from there um so there is a fairly new within the last few months um book right here um it's about fred payne clotworthy um it's called Friend Page Clatworthy, Colorado's Color Photography Pioneer um, by Rochelle Cross Force, um, who's um, local-ish. Um, and that's, um, like I said, it just, it just came out, so it's pretty new. I haven't even read it yet. Um, so there's that, that one. Um, I'm sure some of you have already seen, but um, on the museum's website, um, the SS Park Historian Laureate, Dr. Jim um, Pickering, had, um, kind of a compendium of essays that he's called Essays Old and New, and that is available um, only digitally, um, but it's right on the museum's website. It's right on our front page. Um, so there's that. Um, and then there's um, one called If I Ever Grew Up and Became a Man by William Allen White that we haven't read for this club yet. Um, Legendary Locals of Estes Park by Steve Mitchell we also haven't read, which is surprising. Um, and then my other um, suggestions were um, the cookbook that was kind of placed together. Um, so it's a bunch of local recipes and then stories surrounding those recipes. I'm sure some of you have already read it or have a copy. It's been around for a little while. And then Enos Mills, A Citizen of Nature by Alexander Drummond. Um, does any one of those strike anybody's fancy? So we had Fred Payne Clatworthy, um, Dr. Pickering's essays. Um, if I Ever Grew Up to Become a Man by William Allen White, um, The Cookbook, um, 
Legendary Locals and Enos Mills, A Citizen of Nature by Alexander Drummond. What is the name of the cookbook? Is that? Um, I can go get it and tell you. I don't have it right, right in front of me. Um, anybody else knows? Yeah, does anybody else know right off the top? One by uh, Nancy Pickering Thomas. Yep, yep. I'll go. I can go grab it too. You know what? I have it. I think. Thank you. It's, well, his well, his book that's digital. Be you know, I read a lot of books on my Kindle, but when I'm in a book club, I like it so I can <laughs> take notes. I learned that early. Will that be the essays old and new? Will that be printed, or is it just not digital? as I'm aware of yet? Okay. Um, okay. it's Thank currently you. only available digitally, and we do have it as a PDF and Kindle compatible. Oh, you can print so it you, out. Okay, so sure. you can read. Yep, it's right on our website. Okay, cool. Thank you. It was kind of Dr. Pickering's gift to um, Estes Park during the pandemic as we like early on in I think April, um, he made those available digitally so people could get their hands on some local history while we were all at home. I vote for legendary locals, I've got it. <laughs> You've got it, legendary locals. I was um, gonna say, do you, have, do you have all these books at the museum? Yes. Yep, I mean, except Dr. Pickering's essays, which are only avail available digitally, but everything else we have at the museum. Um, and I will also, if the library doesn't already have copies, I will provide copies to the library to circulate as well um, to get that going. I vote for legendary locals. Legendary locals, cool. I want to read them all, so whatever you choose. Yeah. Whatever. Okay, we're good. Same we're good here. there. And we can choose Same two here. titles. Yeah. So we'll have Sorry. March and April. Sorry, Kim, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, well, sorry, my phone. Um, the legendary locals or the Clatworthy. Okay. And then I better unmute here. <laughs> if I can, or mute. The Clatworthy. Clatworthy, Linda. Anybody, anybody else have strong feelings towards titles? Oh, right I, now, love like I love this cookbook and I had it and I, it's on my bookcase. Now I need to read it. So good. All right, so right now, Legendary Locals and the new Clatworthy book is kind of up front runners. Anybody else want to throw out a title? I just want to make sure everybody knows that uh, Nancy is the brother of Jim Pickering, mm -hmm. or Nancy is the sister of Jim Pickering. <laughs> <laughs> they are siblings, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's do, um, if, it, if this sounds cool for everybody, we'll do Legendary Locals of Estes Park by Steve Mitchell for March. And then April, we'll do the new Fred Payne Clatworthy, Colorado's color photography pioneer. And because that's so new, I thought maybe we could do it in April so it could get circulated a little bit. Um, so we'd all have time to get our hands on it. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah. All is right. Steve Mitchell, is Steve Mitchell still around? Is it... um, I'm not sure, but I'll reach out. I'll try and get both authors if I can, if they're available. Mm -hmm. um, Steve? Steve moved to Iowa, um, but I'm sure he'd be available, I would think. The kind of good thing about Zoom is that no one needs to travel for book clubs. Yeah. Um, as Nina, you can attest, as you sit in Arizona. Um, <laughs> so hopefully we can get Steve on board. Um, all right, that sounds great. All right, so just a couple of dates coming up. Our next museum program is actually this Friday at 2 p.m. Um, we will have our curator of collections, uh, Jessica Minchak, and she's going to talk about um, kind of collections care at home. So how you can kind of um, take care of family heirlooms, photographs, um, any archival material, things like that. So she'll be presenting um, over Zoom um, Friday at 2. And again, that link is on our website. And then our next book club is going to be on St. Patrick's Day. So it's Wednesday, March 17th, again at um, 10 o'clock in the morning. And we'll be reading Legendary Locals of Estes Park by Steve Mitchell. All right, anybody, final questions? Michaela, have you yeah, heard anything about, have you heard anything about Edie du Deweese? Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay, I'm concerned because it was totally unlike her not to make that last book club meeting. And I haven't heard anything about where she's at or anything, so. Hope she's okay, is what I'm saying. 
All right, anybody else? Final questions? Well, with that, it was good to see everyone. Thank you so much for coming and participating this morning. Special thank you to you, Nina, for talking about your amazing book and all of your work. Um, we really appreciate it. So we will see you guys on the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Bye. again, guys. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.